God, our Father, and to Christ our Lord. Today I want to talk to you about test anxiety. I want to talk to you about the tests that we face in life and how we can learn to face those tests victoriously. And I know some of you are going through a great test in your life. It might have been difficult for some of you to be here today or for some of you to be online because you're so worried or you're afraid or you're hurt or you're disappointed or you're grief-stricken. But the best therapy you'll ever get in the world is worship. The best therapy you'll ever get for your soul is to worship God, to draw near to the Lord. And I pray that God will use the Word today to minister to all of you that are going through tests and to prepare all of us to really learn how to live a victorious life. Every day we live, our faith is on the line. It tests our faith. And I'm praying that God will use the word today to build our faith strong, that we can be overcomers. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It is the word of the living God. May the Holy Spirit come with power and speak to us. Reveal your truth unto your people. Speak to every person where they live. And for those that are going through a trial today, a test, I pray that you will make them victorious. Give them the heart of a champion to remember that if God be for them, who can be against them? We pray this in Jesus' name, and God's people said amen. You may be seated. Psychology has coined the term test anxiety to refer to the sense of panic we feel when we take a test or an exam. Regardless of how well a student may know the material, yet in that moment, the mind seems to go blank. The information escapes us. We panic. We lose our confidence. And we perform poorly. We've even categorized math phobia in psychology because so many people panic with a math test because of the exactness and precision. And trust me, math phobia is real. But life has always confronted us with tests as well. We go through tests for education, entrance into college. We go through tests in our professions. We're always facing an examination. In those moments, sometimes we have anxiety and it lowers our performance. And the tests of life have the same effect upon us. And tests come out of nowhere at times. It's kind of like going to class and getting a pop quiz. Those are the risky ones. And everybody usually panics. They didn't know they were... It, it was coming. They're not ready for it. And life is like that. You can be having a great week. Everything in your life is just like you wanted it. And all of a sudden, something happens. Now you're in the test of your life. Everything has changed. You're worried. You're anxious. You're depressed. You're not sure what you're going to do. And life is like that. It can give us a pop quiz. A test just comes upon us. And how do we manage the test of life? This is what the Apostle James writes to us about in the book of James. The book of James is considered to be, by historians, the first of all the New Testament letters written. And James was the half-brother of Jesus. The James who gives us the book of James is not James the apostle that was in the 12, but this is the half-brother of Jesus. He has another brother, Jude, who wrote a book as well. And James and Jude did not really believe in Jesus when he was in his ministry. He was their older brother, and I'm sure they loved him and respected him, but they didn't really believe that he was the Son of God. They certainly were awed by all that was happening in Jesus' life and the popularity and the multitudes that would come to hear him and the miracles. But it wasn't until after the resurrection that James put his faith in Jesus. He started, like a lot of people do, kind of on the, on the edge of spirituality, some skepticism, not really sure until Christ appeared to him. The risen Lord appeared to James personally after the resurrection, and James became a devout follower of Jesus, not only as his brother, but now he knew he's the Son of God, the Savior of the world. How many of you know that your life changes when you meet the risen Christ? And this is the man that became the leader of the church of Jerusalem, according to Acts 15. A great, distinguished, wise leader, James. And the Holy Spirit moves upon him to write a letter to the church to teach us how to live. The Roman government had already started its persecution and it would get more intense in days to come. And it's interesting, in the first letter of the New Testament written, the first theme is how to face test anxiety. It begins this way, James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. James, 
a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be complete and entire, not lacking anything. And then in verse 12, he gives us a blessing. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, for when he or she has stood the test, they will receive what God has promised to those who love him. And here he teaches us how to face the tests of life when we see the reality of tests and, and the challenge of our faith whenever we face those tests. And sometimes we don't feel like we're ready for the test and we feel like the tests of life overwhelm us and we will never be able to pass the test or, or stand the test. Sometimes we feel like the freshman student at college. He took an initial course in zoology and he was struggling through zoology and it came down to the final exam. It was a major university. There were 100 students in this large class and he was worried about the exam. When he comes to the exam, the professor gives him all a written exam and Below the audience, there was a table. The professor put 10 birds on the table, and then he put a cloth over each bird so that you could only see the legs of the 10 birds. He said, now the final exam, if you to tell me everything you can tell me about those 10 birds based on their legs, the classification, the phylum, the species, that's the final exam. Well, his mind went completely blank. He panicked, he couldn't distinguish one from the other. He kind of got angry that this was all the test was going to be and he was going to fail it. So finally, he just took his test back down there, empty, no answers, and then he put his name on it and just put it down in front of the professor and turned around to walk off of it. The professor didn't know all the students' names in the class at large, so he noticed the student didn't even put his name on it. He said, hey, wait a minute, young man. What is your name for your exam? What is your name? And he turned back and pulled up his pant leg and said, guess, buddy, guess. The James reminds us all of something that we need to know, we don't want to know, and that is the reality of test. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many different kinds, because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. He wants us to face the reality, not to have a negative attitude, to always be expecting something bad to happen, not an attitude of pessimism, but also not an attitude an attitude of fantasy and denial, thinking that we'll never have any problems. And it's very important to face the realities of life. We are living in a broken, imperfect world, and the Bible is clear about that from the very outset in the first story of the fall of Adam and Eve. You live in a world of thorns and thistles, he told them. You're going to make your living from the ground. We live in that world. And every person who asked me, Pastor, why is this happening in my life? The main reason is because we live in an imperfect world. And that is just a reality. The good news is God is with us in this imperfect world. And he's prepared heaven for us. But this is an imperfect world. And James is saying, you've got to face the reality of test. And the church was being persecuted. I mean, they love God. They wanted people to know Jesus. And they're being persecuted. And that's confusing for people. But they needed to know the reality of the world they were living in so that they could deal with it and overcome it. And he says, you're going to face trials of many different kinds. Financial trials, trials in your marriage, tests in raising your kids, tests with your physicality, with your health, tests in your business. Going great one year, now the whole business thing changes and now you're having to re rearrange everything. You're going to face tests in the world conditions. It's a reality. And to face life with that reality is so important. So many great men and women in the Bible, we admire them. We admire their stories. We learn from their stories. But all these people went through tests. Abraham went through the test of obedience. It says in Genesis 22, 1, and God tested Abraham. What a powerful brief statement. And God tested Abraham. He was 100 years old when he and his wife, Sarah, had their first baby. That's getting started late. Everybody's getting started late these days. That's really getting started late. It was a miracle. God gave him a great covenant, a great... He was the most blessed man. He was at the height 
of success and prominence and blessing. And in the middle of that grand and glorious state, these three words come crashing in. And God tested Abraham. He tested his obedience. He put him to the test. Job, when you read the story, open this book of Job. It's amazing. It says he was the greatest man in all the East. It, it accounts from an accounting ledger of all the cattle and sheep and livestock that he owned. He was a godly man. He got up every morning and worshiped, prayed for his seven kids. And suddenly, out of nowhere, his farm gets attacked. People steal his wealth. His children get killed in a tragic storm. He gets so physically ill, his whole body is suffering. His wife has a crisis of faith, gives up on God and says, curse God and die. And yet in the middle of it, Job realizes God is with him. And in Job 23 and 10, Job makes a statement in the depth of his suffering. He said, when God has tested me, I will come forth as gold. And the Bible says at the end of that story that God turned the captivity of Job and God blessed him with twice as much at the end as he had at the beginning. And Abraham was tested with obedience. Job was tested with suffering. Jesus was tested by the devil right after his baptism. John said, Behold the Lamb of God. This ministry is beginning. You read Matthew 4, verse 1. And the Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil. The Son of God facing a great temptation, a great detour spiritually. Right after a great spiritual experience, that can happen to us. We have this great spiritual experience, this great visitation of God on our lives, and the next thing you know, we're in the desert with the devil. Paul talked about the test of life that we all face. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He said, there's no temptation seized you except which is common to everyone. But God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. Amen. Mother Teresa commented on that verse one time. She said, I know that God said he'll never give me more than I can handle, but I wish he didn't trust me so much. And the Bible even talks about that we're going to be tested by world conditions. We're living that right now. We are being tested by world conditions. Political changes, economic uncertainty, talks of globalism, environmental conditions, wars breaking out. People are anxious and worried. It seemed like everything was peaceful. And now everything's chaotic. But listen to what Christ tells the church in Revelation 3 and 10, because you have obeyed my command to endure patiently. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world that will test the world. This world is being tested today. God is at work even in the midst of human history, guiding us toward the ultimate goal of history, the return of Christ in a new heaven and a new earth. But even though this world is testing us today, Jesus says, I'm going to keep you from that trial. I'm going to protect you in that trial. I'm going to bless you in that trial. Let us remember today that the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And if God be for us today, who can be against us? And when you're going through that test, you've got to remember that's a real part of life. But God's grace is sufficient for you. And I want to say this to you. I help people all the time as a pastor. So much of my ministry is with meeting with people, trying to help them manage the test of life. And some of it is painful and confusing. And my only goal is to keep their faith strong because I know God is faithful to his people. The most important thing I can tell you if you're going through a test today is don't go through it by yourself. Sometimes people isolate. They get depressed. They stop coming to church. They stop worshiping. You feel bad. You feel anxious. But you need to get some people around you that love you and pray with you and can assure you and give you encouragement. Don't go through that test alone. God has given you a great company to support you and to bless you, to help you get through that test and to pass it. My last year of college, 
I was a psychology major and a minor in biblical studies. My best friend took the exact same degree. We took every course together for four years of college. It was our last year, last semester. We were taking a couple of electives because it's time to get out. And there was a course in pastoral counseling. We were psychology majors, and we figured we'd, that'd be an easy course. Whatever they were talking about, we knew a lot more than them, and that was true when we got in it. And the professor was a retired minister, you know, a great pastor, had such a great pastoral heart, and he talked about pastoral ministry. And, and we had missed an exam, only because we weren't paying attention. We went to him, and he was nice enough to say, well, you can make up the exam. If there are any teachers here today, let me encourage you. It is God's will that you let students make up exams. <laughs> so he said, well, just come by my office. So we went by his office after school, and he was so nice, and he gave us the printed copy of the exam with all the questions. And he said, well, you can just go in that room there and take the exam. We thought he would put us in two different rooms. And we had our books with us and our notebooks from the class with us. And he was very pastoral. Y'all just go in there and take that exam. And whenever you finish, give it to my secretary. And then they shut the door. And it's the two of us sitting there with all the books, all the notebook, and the door closed. Now, I'm not saying we cheated, <laughs> but I can tell you two people taking an exam is a lot better than one. <laughs> that's biblical, by the way. Ecclesiastes 4.10 says, two are better than one <laughs> because they have a good return for their work, and we had a great return between the two of us and those notebooks. We did great. And the James reminds us about the reaction to trials. The way we react is so important. We cannot control what happens to us, but we can control how we react. So he says, consider it pure joy. Don't let that trial eclipse your joy. Choose your attitude. Don't let the trial put you in a state of complete panic and depression. Consider it pure joy. Face it with joy. Enter it with joy. Fight back with joy. Don't let all of the tests of life rob you of your joy. Whenever you face the trials and the testing of your faith, because you know that it develops perseverance. And Jesus said that when you face persecution, the first thing he said to do is rejoice. Listen to Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice. And be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And that's what Peter and John did. They're the first ones who've ever been persecuted for the gospel. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. They're out preaching in public, and they were arrested, and they were flogged with whips and commanded, you cannot preach anymore in Jesus' name. What did they do? The Bible says they rejoiced. They were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. If somebody makes fun of you at school or work because of your faith, don't be angry about that. Rejoice that you are counted worthy. You're making an impact for Jesus. And Peter reminds us of this in his letter. Now, Peter's first letter is written all about suffering. In fact, the key word of the first letter of Peter is the word suffering. It appears over and over. That's all he's talking about because the church was suffering so greatly under the Roman government. And people are confused. They're thinking, we love God. We worship God. Why are we suffering? And he says, you rejoice in the midst of it. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. Don't just rejoice, greatly rejoice. In it, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you've had to suffer grief through all kinds of trials. These have come, these trials have come, so that your faith may be proved genuine. Every test of life puts our faith on trial, that our faith might be proved genuine, not a hand-me-down faith, not the faith of our parents, not the faith of the church we grew up in, but your faith, your faith is going to be put on the line, and mine will, but our faith is genuine, it is real, it is powerful. It'll bring us through every test of life. 
with the victory of the grace of the living God. And so James says, don't enter it afraid and depressed. Don't let all those emotions, as real as they are, just eclipse your joy. But in the middle of it, give God praise that he's going to provide and bless you. Is James saying that we should be happy about our problems? And I was asked that in a television interview in a Christian program one time. A good friend of mine was a great pastor. He was hosted it, got to talking about suffering and issues that people deal with. And he said, well, I guess we should just welcome our problems with joy and be happy. I said, absolutely not. Who's thankful for their problems? That makes no sense to me. Who in their right mind here is thankful for their problems? That's not what he's saying. These difficulties of life and the test of life, there's no joy in those things. It's joy in spite of those things. It's the ability to say, I'm not going to let that test completely destroy who I am. I'm not going to let what happens to me destroy who I am, and it's not going to destroy my relationship with God. That's what he says. When I was a kid, my mom had a balancing scale. It was at her desk where she would pay bills and do work like that. And I was fascinated with this scale. It was brass. The top of it had an eagle with its wings out. And it had these two saucers on the side with little brass chains. And I used to sit at that scale trying to get into perfectly balanced. Life is a balancing act. And every now and again, when the test comes, pain enters the world, and that scale completely tips. And you were here, you, were, you had equilibrium. Everything was great in your life, and all of a sudden now, you're out of balance. And the pain is so great, the fear is so great, it just completely collapses this. It takes over everything. The weight of anxiety and grief and depression just completely takes a person's life over. And the only thing that can balance out the pain is joy, to find joy in life. That's the only antidote to the pain. Now, is it going to take the pain away? No. It's not going to tip the scale the other way but it's gonna bring the pain level up so that you can live in spite of it. It's gonna bring the grief level up where you can live and function and not be completely destroyed and devastated by what's happened to you. And that's what he says. In the midst of all of it, you've gotta keep your perspective. You've gotta keep your worship. You've got to praise God in the midst of all of it. There are three truths I personally live by. Now, I've not been through many trials, to be honest with you. Certainly not like the ones I have helped many of you with and been privileged to walk with you through some difficult times and challenges. But I face my own challenges at times and trials. As a pastor, I face unique challenges that you perhaps don't face. I'm a father, so you know I face trials. As a parent, my marriage is perfect. Marriage is easy, parenting is impossible. That's my assessment so far. So some things are easy for us, some things are hard. And we all have some different trials and tests. And my ministry has been a complete venture of faith. Barbie and I have lived with absolutely nothing. We've seen miracle provision. I always tell myself three things that I live by when I face a test and a trial. One, God is with me. I never doubt God's presence, and I never think that God will ever leave me. And the awareness of God's presence to me personally is the main way I can handle anything in life. The last thing Jesus said before he left this world to his disciples is, I am with you always to the end of the age, Matthew 28 and 20. If you take that to heart, it'll change the way you go through the test. 
The second truth I tell myself is that God will provide. Barbie and I have lived on absolutely nothing at times. We have seen the most amazing provisions. We've seen it as a church family. I've even shared stories with you. It's amazing. God will provide. I have learned that that is true. I don't know how, and I don't even worry about how anymore. In fact, I never in my prayers ever tell God how to do anything. I don't. You can. I know you do because I hear some of you pray. <laughs> Have at it. I'm just tell, I'm testifying right now. You got to get through life, and I'm telling you how I get through it. God will provide. When Abraham and Isaac went up that mountainside, Isaac was a grown young man, probably in his 20s. And he says, where's the lamb? Abraham said, God will provide. God will provide. He still takes five loaves and two fish and feeds a multitude, and nobody goes home hungry, and there's leftovers. David said in Psalm 37, I was young, but now I'm old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. God will provide. And I believe that. And the third thing I know, and I believe, and I tell myself, God will complete his purpose for me. I do not think my salvation depends on my performance. It depends on God's grace. I believe I was born with a destiny like I believe you are, and I preach it to you and to your children. And I've given my life to Christ and believe that God has a purpose for me, and no matter what happens to me or what I do, God will fulfill his purpose. I don't think life is meaningless. I don't think life has no purpose. I believe that when you walk with God, your life takes on significance and meaning, that God will lead you and guide you and direct you and fill your life with divine purpose. And through the ups and downs and the tests and the trials, God will finish what he started. I believe that. It was a revolutionary day, the day I discovered Psalm 138, verse 8, when David wrote, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. I have been in the midst of some severe tests and I've just said, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. And James ends by saying, you need resilience in the test. Three times he used the word perseverance. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Blessed is the one who perseveres. You don't need me to give you some sophisticated definition of the Greek word of perseverance. Who cares? You know what it means. It means don't quit. It means finish what you start. It means be loyal to those you love. It means be bigger than your problems to never give out, to never give up, to never give in. You know what it means. Blessed are those who persevere whatever you're going through today. You make up your mind that you're not going to stop halfway, you're not going to retreat, and you're not going to give up. You are going to persevere through it. That's how you become mature and complete. God uses the test. God does not send the test unless it's a spiritual test of your relationship to him. God does not cause your sickness. God did not cause you to lose your job. Those are the natural sufferings of this broken world. Don't lay that at the doorstep of the Almighty. That's the result of human sin and suffering in this broken world. But in all of that, God is with us. He said, I want to be like these great men and women of faith. All of us are here today because we want to worship. We all want to grow spiritually. We all do. But James says, you've got to persevere through the trial if you want to mature and you want to be complete. You will never be like Noah until you face a flood. You'll never be like Abraham until God demands a sacrifice. 
You'll never be like Joseph until you're put in a prison and face injustice. You'll never be like Moses and you, until you stand by yourself at the edge of a Red Sea. You'll never be like Joshua until you face impregnable walls of Jericho. You'll never be like Esther until you have to lay your life on the line for something important. You'll never be like David until you face a Goliath. You'll never be like Daniel until you sleep in a lion's den. You'll never be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego until you walk in the fire. You'll never be like Mary, the mother of our Lord, until you say with reckless abandon, I am the Lord's servant. You'll never be like Jesus until you carry a cross, and you'll never grow like the Apostle Paul until you have a thorn in your flesh. But I want to assure you that if you'll trust God, for every flood, God will provide an ark of safety. And for every sacrifice, God provides a ram in the thicket. And for every Red Sea, God provides a miracle crossing. And for every Jericho, God will send an earthquake to bring the mighty walls down. And for every Goliath, God will give you five smooth stones of grace to conquer the giant in your life. And for every lion's den, God will send an angel to sleep with you with the lion. And for every fiery furnace, he'll send the fourth man to walk with you through the fire. And for every cross, there's a resurrection on the other side. And for every thorn in the flesh, God's grace is still sufficient. Bless his holy name. So you consider it pure joy today when you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. But perseverance must finish its work so that you can be complete and mature, not lacking anything. Would you stand with me for prayer? Today I want you to bring any test you're facing to God today. And you could pray a simple prayer like, Lord, help me with this test. Help me pass this test. Help me get through this test. I have learned that you can take situations and people and put them in God's hand and let go of it and watch the most extraordinary things happen in your life. God is able. Whatever you're facing today, God is able to bless you and get you through it. So as I pray for you, I want you, if you have a test, I just want you to hand it to God today. If it's your health, your finances, if you've lost your faith and you're struggling with doubt, if you have an addiction, if your marriage is in trouble, if there's an issue going on with your kids or your family, your business is struggling, I want you to put in God's hand today in this simple prayer. Lord, whatever we're facing, you're bigger. You're bigger. Whatever problem we have, your power is greater. Lord, today we put into your hand every trial, every test. We let go of our anxiety. We cast our anxieties on you today. And we know today that you are always with us. You will provide. You'll complete your purpose. And I pray for your people today that you'll bless them. I want you to give them, Lord, a new courageous spirit, a new victorious spirit. And I pray that everyone who's under a trial and a test today, that their faith will be proved genuine going through this trial as a living witness of your grace and glory. Bless them. Bless their homes. Bless their families. Bless their marriage. Bless their finances, Father God. Give them victory in every battle they're facing today. And we give the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Now, I know I testify. Can anybody else testify? Thank you for joining us for worship. What a great time of worship and fellowship we've enjoyed together. Our theme this year is Go For the Glory as we're pursuing the glory of God. Check out the Mount Perrin store online. We have Go For the Glory t-shirts and other gifts. I know that they'll be a blessing to you and to your family. Our Wednesday night services are up and running now for the new year. Great time of dinner, 5.30, program for the entire family. Great worship experience as well. Make sure you join me on social media. Continue to follow me in the church. Worship services, music, events of the church. I know that you want to stay connected. So make sure you follow us on social media. I pray you have an amazing week. I'll see you next Sunday for worship.